Hello everyone. Today is Earth Day and I'm sure none of you will be surprised to hear what story I'm going to read today. For any of you that have not tuned in before, this is Chester. He's my cat. Chloe, our dog, is nearby. Chester likes to join in. He, he loves reading. So I don't know if he'll hang out for the whole story, but he is here. And of course, I have another friend here with me because today we are going to read The Lorax. Any true Dr. Seuss fan has to read this book on Earth Day. It's just the way it goes. You also see that I'm wearing my Christmas tree sweatshirt today because we plant trees at our farm. So, the Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever singing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before somebody lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax and why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere? From the far end of town where the grickle grass grows, the old Munzler still lives here. Ask him, he knows. You won't see the Munzler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkum on top of his store. He lurks in his lurkum, cold under the roof, where he makes his own clothes out of miff muffered moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail, and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather snail. Then he pulls up the pail, makes a most careful count to see if you've paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his grubulous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper my phone. For the secrets I tell are for your ears alone. Shroop. Down slips the whisper phone to your ear and the old Wunzler's whispers are not very clear since they have to come down through a snurgly hose and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Why, way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the Swami Swams rang out in space, one morning I came to this glorious place and I first saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffula fruits. From the ripulous pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming while splashing around. I would love to go here. But those trees, those trees, those truffula trees, all my life I'd been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their tufts was much softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh buttery milk. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffula tree with one chop. And with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft. And I knitted a thneed. The instant I'd finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I'd chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him. It's hard. I don't know if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that 
thing you'd made out of my truffula tuft. Look, Lorex, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I am doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a th need. A th need to find something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses, yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers for bicycle seats. The Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool th need. But the very next minute I proved he was wrong, for just at that minute a chap came along, and he thought that the th need I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety-eight. I laughed at the Lorex, you poor stupid guy. You never can tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorex, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called all my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen, here, here's a wonderful chance for the whole monster family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast, take the road to North Niche, turn left at Weehawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Wunstler family was working full tilt. We were all knitting thneeds, just as busy as bees, to the sound of the chopping of truffula trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Now chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker, which whacked off four truffula trees at one smacker. We were making thneeds four times as fast as before, and that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week he knocked on my new office door. He snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go around. And my poor barbaloots are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. They love living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the Onceler, felt sad as I watched them all go, but business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not. But I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads. Of the thneeds I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more thneeds. And I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed, and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snargled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a cruffulous croak. Onceler, you're making such smogulous smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note. No one can sing who has smog in his throat. And so, said the Lorax, please pardon my cough. <coughs> they cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the Lorax. His dander was up. Let me say a few words about Gluppity Glup. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making Gluppity Glup also sloppity slop. And what do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old Wunzler man, you. 
You're glomping the pond where the humming fish hummed. No more can they hum, for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off. Oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorex, now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap yap and say bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorex, I'm figuring on figuring and figuring and figuring and figuring, turning more truffula trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffula tree of them all. No more trees, no more thneeds, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, everyone, all waved me goodbye. They jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad-smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance. As he lifted himself by the seat of his pants, and I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place, through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with the word.